Hi, everyone. My name's uh, Greg Hartrell. I'm the uh, lead product manager for Google Play Games. Uh, thanks for attending this session today. When I, when I started putting this session together, I, I, I started, you know, I realized I have this, the great privilege of seeing a lot of people make games really fantastic experiences and, and watching the joy that it brings people. And I, I went back and I, I looked at what people are doing today in terms of playing games and came up with a few portraits of what I see happening today. You know, the, the, the first is, is, by and large, mobile games still a, very much a single player experience. You know, it's the portrait of, you know, a kid sitting on the couch staring into a screen. And when I see that, I, I think, you know, whatever that kid's playing, they're never going to remember that moment. And that's, that's weird for me because, you know, when I grew up, when I was a kid, I remember playing games with others, with family, with friends. Um, and so, and so th that, that, that's something that, I've, that I, I considered bizarre. The console industry, you know, we created another persona. Right? I think the original promise of consoles was we take the arcades of old, we bring them into the living room, you know, people would play together, it, was, it would be a fantastic experience. But what you also observe is still, you know, this kind of picture of a guy sitting in a basement staring at a screen. And if we put a headset on this guy, we'd call it, call it to be fair, we call it social. Um, and, and, you know, if you were to put a headset on and start playing with these types of players, um, you know, your mileage will vary. You know, if you're, like my experience, you might run into a 13-year-old yelling at you something about your mother. Um, and then there was this brief area that we were very excited about with, you know, social games. Um, and we, we don't see a lot of these games in their, in their original incarnation. Because I guess sending palette knives to your, your, your friends was, wasn't, wasn't a thing. Um, but games decided to move away from that and try to do some more, try to pursue deeper social interactions. And see, this is the deal. Games, they have so much more potential than this, right? If you, if you, you think about the experiences that you had when you were younger or the positive moments that you've had in, in playing games with others, you, you, you know that they are capable of this. And there's evidence if you look around you know, in the physical world as well as in the video game world. You know, so I started pulling up quotes. Quoting Greek philosophers immediately gives you street cred, so I recommend it for everybody. But if you look at Plato, Plato's saying something profound here. He says, you know, if you play with somebody, you can learn a lot more about them than perhaps any other interaction that you can conceive of. If you want to get more academic, you can quote a guy like Johann Huizinga, who wrote a, a book called Homo Ludens, which is Latin for man at play, kind of a seminal book in game studies. And, and his premise is this, games aren't merely a pastime. They connect us in a way that defines our personas, defines the way our communities be, uh, form, our cultural norms, and even the way that nation states form, if you want to get very profound about it. Um, and we're surrounded to and attracted by games and, and the ability to play games with others. And in that sense, all play has, has meaning. And so what these quotes really told me was, is like, you know, look, games are really just fundamentally this thing that we do, this fundamental behavior of being human. We create relationships through them. We express ourselves through them. We come together through them. And if you look closer, there's really good examples in the physical world where games teach us, you know, and connect us in unique and interesting ways. So, you know, I looked at retirement communities. For, you know, for the record, Retirement looks awesome. I'm, I'm reconsidering this whole work thing and just skipping to that stuff. They're, they're constantly playing games. The, you know, it's card games, it's board games, it's shuffleboard, it's bocce, well, you, you name it, you can, you, you can find them playing it. And you can easily dismiss this as like, oh, they're just finding a way to pass away time. But it's more than that. What they're doing is, is that they're finding a way to connect with each other. Sometimes they don't even know who, we, who they are. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a way for estranged peoples or, or people who just, you know, are complete strangers to suddenly find a common bond, get acquainted with each other. This is a screenshot here, of, uh, or a, a picture, I should say, of something called the Wall Street freeze tag event. Um, it's been like nine or ten years running. The people who live in the neighborhood that is Wall Street in New York, they get together and they go outside and they have a freeze tag game. And if you've been in the northeastern United States, you know that in the winter it gets, gets kind of cold. 
Um, and so, so here's an example of games that bring together groups of people to do seemingly inane things um, and somehow has the power of drawing them together. The, uh, the MIT you know, annual mystery hunt is a little bit legendary. It's been running since 1981. It attracts about 2,000 students annually across 100, 100, 150 teams. And what, what they do is they have these puzzles that give them clues that come in sequence that allow them to discover a coin that's hidden around campus. And your reward for solving all the puzzles and finding the coin is you get to write the puzzles for the next year's team. And that's, that's it. Um, and what I love about this chart is it just shows like the, 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 the intensity, the velocity of all these people wanting to pursue and accomplish those goals and to try to you know, attain something that they can be proud of. And you know, the, I, I have to bring up the World Cup. If you, if you haven't been inside of a stadium with 100,000 people, I promise you it's the most exhilarating experience you've ever had. And, and it's not just because you know, you're, you're watching and rooting for your team. Hopefully your team won. If your team didn't win, then I refer you to the retirement slide. Italy. Um, but, but, but the idea here is, is that you're not just there to root for the team. You get drawn into the fact that there's just so many people of a, of a like mind bringing this community of people together in a common bond. And so all of these experiences really just boil down to this. At, at their best, games bring us together. And video games, to be fair, have been good at this. We can find moments in video game history where we're brought together through meaningful interactions. There's arcades of old. There's the modern equivalent of barcades, where a genius said, if I combine alcohol with arcades, I'll have a business. Um, and, then, and then there's living room multiplayer. We remember games like GoldenEye and, and, and you know, current games like, let's say, Mario Kart. And they, they, they have the intent the, and the ability to bring people together in very small ways. And of course, MMORPGs, which, you know, when you play some of these, you sometimes wonder, hey, I'm just really in a chat room and there's this game thing I do on the side sometimes. And so, if we accept the idea that games are better when we're playing together, the question is, is can, can the environment we currently have change? Do we have the conditions necessary to relive and create all of those experiences that I just showed in the physical world um, and, I, and, and, and to me, I think the answer is yes, because Android and Google Play represent one of the greatest opportunities for us to reach people through our game. So I want you to consider this. Yesterday you heard that there's one billion active Android users. That's not total, that's 30-day actives. That's a lot of people. And three in four of those users are playing games. When you do the table napkin math on that, that might be the largest group of people playing games on any platform ever created. What we also talked about was Google Play Games growing at a tremendous clip. This is our, our game network for Android, iOS, and the web. And we announced yesterday that we added 100 million new users in the past six months. That makes this game network the fastest growing mobile game network ever. With an ecosystem this large, though, you need something like Play Games that's going to connect these users together. And I'll take a moment to thank the developers that have, have gotten us to this point by integrating Play Games and bringing people together through the game services that we offer. Um, we're seeing great results from uh, titles implementing achievements, leaderboards, cross-screen cloud saves, and social features like multiplayer and game gifts. And we'll talk about some of the new services in a moment and how they, they play into that. So those stats are impressive. and game services are showing promise for a lot of the games that integrate them. But what this really means is this. You have so many people playing games with these devices that are ubiquitous in your pocket, capable of playing or reaching incredible uh, experiences and entertainment, and you have cloud services that get you global reach. This is the time for us to make games social again. We believe that games at their best bring people together and the conditions and opportunity to do so are right now. Now, that's, that's an easy call to action to say, but you have to consider, OK, well, it's, there's nothing magical about you know, a platform and the number of people. There has to be a reason. There has to be kind of a, a system in which you, the way you think about it. So you know, I realize that one way to look at this is you can dissect the way that all of these games kind of 
take design approaches for reaching people and bringing them together. And they do so roughly in these three buckets. The first is creating new relationships. Uh, we help people directly engage each other in games and we bring groups of people and this nucleus of people together to play together. Um, we also help people express themselves through games. We, we feel good when we become confident at a task or when we're achieving certain goals. And we want to represent that self to others. And the last is we build, can build a sense of belonging. So many people find better motivation through passive forms of social interaction. And games help people identify with and get accepted by a community of people of like minds. So I want to step through each, each of these and talk about some stories of where I think we've been effective at this in the, in the industry and talk about how play games helps you get there. So I'll go back to board games because I mentioned them earlier. And more specifically, you know, the board game groups that you see today. I think many people will think of the heyday or the golden age of board games, the Monopolies, the Scrabbles, or maybe later the Settlers of Catan, or um, you know, in my household, I guess it would be Candyland. Queen Frostine is a big deal. Um, but the idea here is, is that you know, video games have, have had an intent and have captured the spotlight. And, and when you dig a little deeper, you realize that there's a tons of these board game groups out there that are thriving. This is a screenshot from meetup.com. This group here that brings together all these board game groups has 308,000 members in 42 countries. It's a lot of people. Um, and when you look at the things that people say and kind of the group names that are out there, you're seeing friends and family playing, but you're also seeing complete strangers coming together through this medium. Even this one actual group game that I, I pulled out that says, you know, extremely shy looking for friends. You know, if you're, if you're considered to be an introvert, this would be an incredibly, you know, an open invitation to just start, you know, playing with others and being an icebreaker for you. But board games don't just do this because it's just groups. Games are effective at this because what they do is they're, they're in the business of simulating social bonds. And what I mean by this is, is that we, we remove the risks of you know, competition and cooperation in an environment where it's safe to be wrong or, or just to fail. For example, we can create low-risk competition and trade-offs between people who don't even know each other. Or if you and I are playing a strategy game, there's a, a reason for us to collaborate, perhaps form an alliance. Um, and th and that's, that's a way to kind of break the ice and have two people who not, don't necessarily know each other start to build a relationship. And the best part is, if you're really great at this, you, you, the experience is a little different every time. Um, and that brings you back and encourages you to keep playing. Uh, a phenomenon that's going on right now is this phrase called fidgetal. If you haven't figured this one out, it's physical meets digital board games. Um, and, and, and what's really interesting about these is that these are, these are basically you know, hybrid board games. They, they take a physical board. But what they do is they have gameplay assistance through mobile devices. The screenshots that you see up here for an upcoming game, I think it was a Kickstarter uh, project called Golem Arcana. Um, what, what they do here is really clever. They, they, board games, particularly the ones with miniatures, can have very complicated rules. You might, you might spend two or three hours just teaching somebody how to play, and then by then everybody's bored. But what's great is the, the, the tablet acts as the, as the referee. It knows all the rules. It knows how to take turns. It directs and guides what people will do next. Um, and there's a little bit of a renaissance here going on in, in, in the way that the physical world meets the digital. And when I read what players are saying about these games, it's very encouraging. You know, you, I, I hear quotes like, you know, I can focus on my friends and not on the board. Or there was another memorable one, you know, of a guy saying like, hey, I can, I can see my, my girlfriend and I playing this every night, and which is a testament to how accessible, you know, a complicated game can be for, for a larger audience. And so this hybrid experience creates that nucleus, the small nucleus of players, and it's a great example of how games will continue to bring groups of people together. I want to go back to arcades as well. The original arcades, you know, if you, if for those, I guess I'm, I'm old enough now to kind of reminisce about this, is that, you know, in North America particularly, they were a cultural hangout of sorts. You know, friends and strangers would engage in games. It was a relatively simple way for people to hang out and all ages have fun and without spending too much money. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you a personal story of mine. It was in an arcade, I was eight years old, and I played a game called Duck Hunt. And for those of you that remember Duck Hunt, it was a light game, you know, you shot cartoon ducks. No ducks were harmed in the making of that game, I'm sure. Um, and yes, games were violent back then too. 
And, you know, I, I was particularly good at this game. I popped in one quarter and I just kept playing and, and I, I, I wasn't losing. I, I just kept knocking them all down and incrementing every level. And I got to a point where I'm like, you know, I'm at like level 92. I wonder if it'll go to level 100. And I just kept playing, 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 playing. And I got to level 99, passed it, expecting it to get to level 100. And to my dismay, they didn't think there was a level 100. It actually just stated level 99. No one, the guy didn't code it to have a third digit. And so I gave up. I, I handed the light gun to, the, to a guy who was sitting, or standing next to me, rather. And I turned around, and as an eight-year-old kid, there's a group of 40 people who have been watching me the entire time. This kid that's just cleaning up duck hunt for, you know, like, it's nobody's business. And, you know, it's for an eight-year-old kid getting high fives from random strangers, right, and, you know, getting cheers, that's a really cool moment, right? And that wasn't possible without the way that arcades are set up, because you have friends and you have strangers who are playing together, you're kind of co-located. The pattern is there's this nucleus of people who love playing games, and you, you have the freedom to kind of connect with people in that type of environment. You can meet anybody as long as you have similar interests, and you make friends and returns, and experiences that, well, you can apparently tell everybody for the rest of your life. Um, a game that I think is particularly good at this simulating that pattern is one called Ingress. This is made by Niantic Labs. It's a science fiction themed game, massively multiplayer game using location and augmented reality. That's a lot of buzzwords. Basically, you, you choose a faction, um, the enlightened and the resistance, and you try to capture these portals by visiting them with your, your, your device and visiting these points of interest, which are basically landmarks in the real world. And as a team captures a set of portals, which you can see by these different dots, um, you know, you create more surface area and connect them for what your faction controls. You know, you can see here in this screenshot, the green team's got this amount of surface area covered. Now, one day they zoomed out 100x um, and, you know, they saw this. The green team has this really bizarre and massive surface area. I mean, this is covering virtually the entire state of California. But the bizarre part is in the northeast corner there of that triangle, that's in the middle of the desert. There's no cell signal out there. How do you, how do you capture something like a point of interest without a cell signal? So the opposing faction rightfully complained and said, you look, there's no, there's no way that anybody did this. They must be hacking it. So the, the, la the Niantic Labs team uh, investigated this, and it turns out it was actually real. What happened was is that those people from that faction decided to rent a portable cell tower. <laughs> Dead serious. They, they, they spent a few thousand dollars, they drove it all the way out into the Nevada desert, they set it up, popped open the game, captured whatever the point of interest was out there, and then this, this, is, the, this is the part that I love. They, they took the cell tower down, so now nobody can go back there and recapture the portal. <laughs> That was really clever. And, and, and so I, I, I use this story because English demonstrates like how what they're doing really is that you know, th this is a set of people who are friends or maybe people who are just brought together in this simulated social bond using video games you know, in all of these ways that I've described earlier. And, and it's, it, it's encouraging to see that li alive and well. So let me take a step and talk about relationships and what Play Games does to help us build those. Um, if you remember the 90s like I do, you remember really bad dance music, feel-good group sitcoms, and a game called NBA Jam. And, you know, if you've played it on mobile, and you should, um, you'll remember that you missed it. Um, it's, it uses the Play Games multiplayer system to connect users and friends in and, and, and real-time play um, with all of the, the excitement of the, of the arcade. What they take advantage of, though, that's really great is something that we call auto-matching. And auto-matching accesses the hidden social graph of your game. These are people who are playing right now, so that way there's always somebody to play with. So it really has that pattern of creating that nucleus of players that are always there. And so whether it's strangers or friends, it's a wildly fun experience. Um, our multiplayer system accesses your social graph. We rank and sort it based on active players, players you've played with recently. Um, it comes in real time in turn-based multiplayer forms, and we handle the notifications and, and, and turns for you, and handle all the hard problems like punching through gnats and creating peer-to-peer -peer sessions when it comes to real-time play. If you're interested in a, a very good example of a turn-based multiplayer game, it's 1941 Frozen Front by, by Handy Games. 
Um, I recommend you try it out, especially if you like strategy games. Uh, and a quick I mention here too is for turn-based multiplayer, we're adding it to our Play Games C++ SDK, which will be supported by Cocos 2DX, um, which will make it e even easier for you to implement multiplayer in your title if you're still uh, making games in native code. Another game that I'll point out is uh, QuizUp. QuizUp makes a, takes great advantage of our achievements and leaderboards. Uh, the game encourages you to answer trivia questions with strangers and friends. Um, and, and leaderboards, I think, for, for those of you who are longtime game designers, tried and true way of fostering competitions by extending your gameplay and people try to beat each other's best scores. What's great about our social leaderboards, though, is you know I'm, I'm never going to be number one in, in the Quiz Up worldwide leaderboard, but I can apparently be number three amongst my friends. And if I'm really excited about the game, I'll invite them along so I can try to try to get to number one. Uh, another service that we launched recently was Game Gifts. This is Eternity Warriors 3 by Glue Mobile. Um, MMO, RPG, uh, hack and slash type game. Really fun experience. Uh, you, you basically, the, the Game Gifts is designed for games that want more lighter weight social interactions. You're, you're not going to find everybody who's willing to sit down and play a real time multiplayer game, but you could convince them to just do a very simple in and out social interaction with a high, and a high degree of reward. In this case, they use it to send potions that give your friends an edge um, with, with some set of limits uh, you know, each day. And sending gifts works a lot of the ways that multiplayer does today. Um, you can use the same social graph. You get your game discovered in the process, but I'll explain this, the mechanics of this in a little more depth. You can think of it in three phases. The game gift service you know, pops open an intent, that you, the, the, the gift intent that players use to choose up to eight people to send basically a blob of data that represents this in-game object, like a potion or a free life. And when you send it to friends, we'll store it on our servers for several days while their friend, your friends decide what they want to do with it. The receivers, those friends, get notified based on their notification settings. If they have set you up as a priority notification, it'll buzz the phone and they'll get into the game. And if it's an unsolicited notification, then it'll show up silently in the shade. Finally, when the receiver's ready to consume the gift, they open it up in the Play Games inbox or the Play Games app, and it will launch your game. And as with multiplayer, if the receiver doesn't have the game, we'll redirect them to the Play Store so they can acquire. And so if you're in the business of getting incremental installs, this is an acquisition pro tip for you. I mentioned the Play Games app. Um, this is our, our, our consumer experience that kind of aggregates you know, all of this, the, this the, what your friends are playing and creates that nucleus of player activity that I keep referring to that's so effective. And like the arcade or the common places where people play, like what Ingress does, Play Games gives you a view of what your friends have played recently and creates kind of that community feel, constantly reintroducing you to your friends and seeing what they're playing. So after you know, you've, you've long stopped playing a game, you can keep up with what your friends are doing, are doing and you can invite them again. Okay, so that covers relationships. Um, the second model, part of our model here is expression. Um, expression is a really interesting thing. Is that ga games help you motivate us because we accomplish something and they, we, by accomplishing things, it kind of improves our well-being. We express ourselves through accomplishments. We do so through mastery and gaining confidence, and we enjoy sharing the, that, that accomplishment with others. And there's a lot of real science behind this. It, it, it can be boiled down to this, but it's a well-known area of study called self-determination theory. Um, I'm not going to do self-determination theory um, in justice in two minutes, but I'll tell you a story. Harry Harlow is a, a, a professor of psychology at the University of Wisconsin from, in 1949, and he did a a study with primates or, or monkeys um, to kind of prove what drives and motivates people, or rather he, monkeys in this specific case, to, to complete tasks. And he had this interesting setup where he took two monkeys and he put, you know, in their living space, okay, they were cages, and uh, he put a puzzle inside of the cages and he noticed a couple things. One is, is that he would, he would reset the puzzle every day and each monkey would go and take a look at the puzzle and then start figuring it out and solve it. And they would consistently do this over and over again. And that didn't really invalidate his experiment. It just kind of like, oh, that's, that's interesting, that they would automatically just be drawn to doing some arbitrary task. And then to set up a variable, what he did is he, he gave one monkey a treat every time that monkey completed the puzzle every day. 
And after a time, he took the treat away. And he noticed something really interesting. The monkey that got the extrinsic reward, the treat, stopped solving the puzzle because he wasn't getting the treat. But the other monkey that was left as the control continued to solve the puzzle every day as long as he reset it. So what was re really interesting here is, is that the unrewarded monkey found the act of completing the puzzle alone satisfying. Later, this was proved with humans through something called the uh, overjustification effect. Um, and what it sh shows us is this, is that the act and the satisfaction of accomplishing something and gaining mastery is something that we're drawn into. And game design, really good game design, takes advantage of this in really deep ways. But expression goes deeper than accomplishment. There, there's also the desire to express oneself or even escape through a persona. Um, there's, there's tons of research on MMORPGs that show how people grow attached to their online personas and avatars, showing a sense of identity and relationship with the characters that you create and as you interact with others. So I, you know, I went onto the role-playing section on the Google, Play, uh, the Google Play Store, and I was thinking of you know, the well-worn fantasy and medieval, medieval titles. Um, and it turns out there's a lot of other ways to role-play too. So you know, there's games like Knights and Squires here, or at the bottom, Stargirl Beauty Queen, which is now my, my personal favorite. Um, and role-playing is partially, really about expressing yourself per, per, through personification. What I love about these games, it shows like whether you, you, age or gender, everybody kind of gets attracted into like the dollhouse effect of these games, and, and, and it's, a, it's a way for people to kind of escape from everyday life. Um, and while I'm talking about expression, I'll splice this one in, is you know, sometimes you just play games to you know, blow off some steam. And this is best demonstrated by this Japanese table flipping game. Maybe we get some audio here. No? Audio? Here we go. Rack up the points. Beating the table, supposedly getting angry. Get ready. <laughs> oh, you missed you missed the mom. <laughs> Okay, so table flipping isn't for everybody, but I, I think w w what's, what's important here is, is that games have a variety of ways of helping people express themselves, either in very personal ways or, or, or as it were, very inane ways. Um, Play Games has a number of tools that help you tap into that sense of accomplishment, help people express themselves to others, and we provide a platform in which you can do it. The, uh, the great thing about achievements, for example, is they inform your players of the, the depth of your game that otherwise you wouldn't have, have discovered. You know, when I finish playing a game like Hitman Go, am I done? Um, I've completed all the levels, but, but the, these achievements give me hints. They're almost like a guideline of what else I can do in the game, and they cause me to play the game differently. They cause me to play it longer in an effort to explore and complete all the content. Um, and in return, we've seen game developers see pretty significant bumps in day-over-day -day engagement through great achievement design. And it, exposing that information at a platform level is a way that we draw people back in through the Play Games platform. Um, talking about Google Play Games right now is we now show the world what type of player you are through our, our new game profile. Um, the game profile is where you earn points uh, and a level and vanity titles from unlocking achievements. Um, and so through your play, your, your profile evolves. Uh, you saw this yesterday in the keynote. The closer look at, at my profile here is you can see the, you know, my profile picture there with my, my level. Um, and the number of experience and points that I need to get to the next level, and let's face it, who doesn't like leveling up? There's, there's a breakdown of the genres that I play, which I, I found really interesting when, it, when this first came live. I, I didn't think of myself as a puzzle game player, but it turns out when you look at the games that I play, that is the type of gamer I am. And if I lo look ahead, I can compare my profile to other friends, and they may be an action game player, or they may play a lot of music games. And that, that gives me an invitation to talk to my friends and something to compare with. 
And as a developer, you can go to the Google Play Developer Console today. If you have achievements, you can edit the maximum 1,000 experience points that you can give out to all, across all of your achievements. There's no update to your game necessary to help players engage in this type of an experience. I mentioned comparing to friends, so this is my friend Tom. Um, and here I can see, you know, he, all the different games that he's played in the different genres, and I can kind of see that, oh, he's, he's this really cool, you know, arcade player, and he loves playing those types of games, and that's, that's how he's gotten to a higher level than, than, than I have. And for the more competitive, it allows you to compare that progress amongst the different genres. We also announced a new service called Saved Games. Uh, this helps you stay connected with users by storing their saved, days sa their saved progress visually and showing it off. Um, the best part about this is it's not just about storing blobs. You can store many blobs as powered by drive. They're up to three megs in size. And players will never have to play level one again in your game across any screen. But what we can also allow you to do now is give us a screenshot or cover image and description and time played. And we expose those in the play game's experiences. And so, you know, if I go on vacation and I forget that I'm playing a game like Leo's Fortune at the top there, I'll pop, pop up my app and I'll be like, oh yeah, that's right. I did leave off at level three and I remember loving that game and I'm gonna continue to play it now. So it really acts as a, as a digital bookmark attracting players to come back to your game and we think it's a neat little retention tool. Okay. And last but certainly not least, I'm going to talk about uh, building a sense of belonging. The, perhaps the best story I can tell here is through the game High School Story from Pixelberry Studios. Um, they're here in the Bay Area and decided that they take a strong position on building a feeling of belonging through game design. Uh, th this game here, High School Story, started with the notion that you know, growing up in high school years is, is hard and Fitting in is a general problem for all. And there's a very powerful story by creating a sense of belonging here um, and helping with the issue of cyber building, bullying. And this story is really best told by their CEO, Oliver Miao. We designed high school story uh, to be about a group of misfits who don't always fit in at their old high school. And they come together to design their dream high school. Because of our storyline, we've had a lot of players who've told us that the game has given them more self-confidence or an ability to feel like uh, they can just be themselves. And so it's messages like that that really have encouraged us uh, to continue with these type of storylines. Uh, but we were really shocked when we um, had a message from a player uh, that was much more serious. We had a player reach out to us via our in-game support. And she told us that she was planning to kill herself. We were surprised, shocked, and scared. We didn't know what to do. We called the suicide prevention hotline, and based on their advice, we urged her to get professional help. But we also let her know that we were there to listen to her. And over time, after exchanging messages with her for about a week, she told us that she was finally getting professional help, and that it was because of our game that she was still there. That incident showed us the power of a game and how when players feel connected to a game and to a community, it can make a real difference in their lives. After that, we partnered with the Cyber Smile Foundation to create a special cyberbullying storyline that teaches players what to do if they or their friends are being bullied. Players also are given links to Cyber Smile, and if they have questions uh, directly from within the game, um, they're connected to Cyber Smile counselors. As a result, every week, over 100 of our players get in touch with Cyber Smile. These are players who are often being bullied, sometimes self-hurting, or even uh, thinking about suicide. In fact, they shared with us a story about a player who was on a rooftop, and they were able to talk the player down, get them in touch with their parents, um, and help get their life back on track. Those type of stories are amazing to us. We started our game thinking that we'd have a great source of entertainment for players, and if we could, we could help build some community. But knowing that our game has been involved in saving lives, helping people have self-confidence, and connecting them to their parents and their friends um, has been really inspirational to us. So that's a deep topic. Um, not every game can claim that they tangibly help people save themselves from themselves. Um, and, and what's really fantastic about what Pixelberry Studios is doing is helping raise awareness with their players and recognizing the damage 
that cyberbullying has on people's lives. And, and for those individuals, this game has been able to give them that sense that there's somebody out there. It gives them that, that feeling of belonging. Um, it, it helped encourage them to reach out in, in, in an environment where they might, may have otherwise not chosen to. But this isn't just merely because they decided to make a game called High School Story. It's really because their design goals are the reason why they became effective at this. And so when you look at the things that they took into account and talked to them about their game design objectives, they take into account race and gender and, and of course, the anti-bullying message that you heard earlier. Um, so, so players identify with characters of apparent different ethnic backgrounds. Other players are happy to see no restrictions on dating and relationships in the game, even between genders. Um, and, and so this goal carries today as they, they update the game. Um, to give you an idea of what they're up to next, they're going to have this update to, to create um, a screenshot of an upcoming future where, where they, they raise awareness of regional and, and world events. And by asking players trivia questions that indirectly inform them of, you know, potentially serious issues and things to, to, to be in touch with. Um, and so, so now they're kind of shifting away from not just the, 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 the immediate locale of, of, of building a community, but engaging a world community. So let's talk about play games and, and what it means to build a sense of belonging. We launched this feature that we call Quest, and it's acknowledging that many highly successful games um, know how to build and engage a vibrant community of players and sometimes this takes the form of a weekend challenge to find rare objects. Or in the case of Pixelberry, they'll, they'll, they'll progress their story through a set of in-game objectives for a period of time. Um, but running these timed events is actually tricky for developers. It, it, and we thought our game services would help. So Quest is a set of APIs that allow you to run these time-based events for your players and reward them without needing to update your game. To do this, developers send us in-game activity data um, whenever a player successfully accomplishes something in the game, like completing a level, killing an alien, saving a rare black sheep. Uh, this tells Quest what's going on in the game, and developers can use that game activity to create these new quests and run these quests on a regular basis as players achieve the goals. We think it's going to be a fantastic tool for re-engagement and retention, and I'll take you through a little bit very quickly how it works. First, you start by using our events API and defining events of in-game activities inside of the Play de Developer Console. So let's say it's a pirate game and you, it's the number of treasures you've discovered in the game. You integrate the events in your game and our quest listener, and signed-in players start sending signals of that in-game activity. You can then use the Developer Console to monitor which activities are being used. So let's pretend for a moment that this treasure uh, mechanic in my pirate game is actually pretty popular and that everybody loves discovering hidden treasure. So I can go into the Play Developer Console and I can define a quest. I can use treasures, the events that are being sent to me, as the criteria for completing the quest. So for example, I could create a find 50 treasures this weekend, gain super secret awesome reward for your trouble, and I publish it. And as players go through that and accept the quest and go through the, that activity in your game, we automatically aggregate the criteria that you, you defined in your quest and describe to your game when somebody has accomplished the goal or whether time's up and they haven't. And we'll send a unique reward code so you can design your game to reward those users every time they complete a quest. The beauty of this design is you can continue to run quests without updating your game because it's entirely data-driven. Um, and, and we're really excited to see what's going on here um, and what you will do with, with, with Quest when it launches in a couple weeks. Uh, and, and those experiences for Quest will show up in the Play Games app by showing players which quests are available for your game and notify them for quests that are about to expire and call them back. Um, while we're talking on the topic of you know, gender and designing towards certain types of demographics, I'll mention our game statistics. When you integrate Play Games into your title, you get access to player activity engagement statistics just through, by virtue of, of, of having people sign in. And so we recently updated our stats to include demographic information. You can get a sense of what the ratio of gender is in your game, what countries are the most active, um, and, and, and what, uh, what age ranges you're attracting. So if, if you're accomplishing your design goals and getting out to a certain type of audience, this is a great way to confirm that. In, tune your updates towards those players. 
So that brings me to uh, the end of this talk. Uh, so, so games, at the end of the day, are really about creating these positive moments. Um, I know with your creativity and game design savvy, Google Play Games will help you find the means to connect with users through these tools, creating new relationships, helping people express themselves, and building belonging between people. Um, and th this is the set of tools. Um, I encourage you to look, look at when the docs get published in a couple weeks, it rolls out with the next set of, Save Games and Quests rolls out with the next set of play services, um, along with our Play Games app. And remember this, it's almost like everybody's playing games now. You have these ubiquitous devices in your pocket, and Android and Google Play have helped create an environment where this is possible. At their best, games bring us together, and mobile games can be great at this again. So my ask to you is go forth and make your game social again. If you want some resources on Google Play Games, you can find them here. This is a great time to take a screenshot of the QR code. And with that, I thank you for your time. I'll be taking... <laughs>